Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to Wasika Votes. This is our first debate in a series of three. We hope you're going to enjoy this evening. First of all, I want to go over the rules of engagement, if you will, so that everyone has a clear understanding of how this debate is going to work. So what we'll start with is uh, opening remarks from each of our candidates. And then our moderator, Mr. Hansen, uh, will ask each of the candidates multiple questions on a rotating basis. Each of them will have one and one half minutes to respond. And after they have answered the question proposed by the moderator, then the opponents will be given one and a half minutes for a rebuttal if needed. The questions you're going to be asked this evening have been put together by the members of the Chamber of Commerce's Legislative Committee, some of whom are seated on the stage this evening. There will be five to six questions asked this evening during the first round of questionings. After the first round, we'll have a recess for about 10 minutes. Members of our assembly, you are each given a card in your programs where you then can ask a question of the candidates our ushers will collect those questions, and our panel will then bring them up, look through them, and figure out which questions will be asked. Our timekeeper will keep track of the response. After one minute is up, the timekeeper will raise a yellow card, signaling that you have one half minute until the gavel is sounded and your microphones will be silenced. At any point during the question and answer period of this debate, if either of the candidates veers off of the question, the moderator will interrupt you and bring you back to the question. Your time will not be yielded back to you. During our debate, proper decorum is important to create an atmosphere that is appropriately formal and encourages order. During the debate, we ask that you hold your applause, ladies and gentlemen, uh, until after the question has been asked and answered, and then the rebuttal given. Any outbursts or uncongenial verbalizations will be met with we asking you to leave the auditorium. It is truly our hope that you will walk away this evening with a clear understanding of where each of the candidates on stage stands on a variety of itch issues. So with that, please enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. It's great to have you here, Mr. Zimmerman, Mr. Madsen. My name is John Hanson, as stated before. Uh, I teach here at the high school, uh, American Government and CIS, University of Minnesota Political Science class. Uh, my students are a part of this program as well, and we are grateful for this collaboration and uh, excited about this opportunity to participate tonight. And again, thanks for being here. Uh, I ask your forgiveness in advance. I'm fighting a bit of a cold, but I did not want to miss the opportunity to be here. So uh, my voice might be a little bit odd, but that's okay. People are here for you and to hear what you have to say tonight. So we tossed a coin earlier and uh, the decision was made and the choices were made to begin our opening statements. And it's a three minute opening statement. And we'll begin with Mr. Zimmerman. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you, Mr. Hansen, and your class for uh, once again um, facilitating these debates. And thank you to the chamber and their committee for uh, now participating as well with these debates. And um, I want to thank the community and uh, that has supported me so far and um, th for those that are here in the audience tonight. Uh, my name is Randy Zimmerman. And uh, I was born and raised in Wasika, and my family has a long storied history in, in the community. Um, and uh, I'm a, I've been married to my wife, who we are both graduates of Wasika High School. We've been married for 26 years, and we have uh, four children. And I've been uh, involved with um, community leadership and service to the community most of my adult life. Um, whether it's through uh, working with the band program uh, for 18 years. I think I'm in my 18th season, I believe. Um, and coaching softball and coaching volleyball. And uh, I served 10 years on the school board, as um, elected to the school board. And um, so I've served my church uh, as a stewardship chair and have been a worship leader with music for 
at least 15 years, I believe. Um, so it's kind of a passion of mine. I believe in, in servant leadership and I um, take that very seriously. Um, why I'm running for a re-election? I'm running for a re-election as mayor to continue with the progress that we've made um, with moving the city of Wasika forward. Um, And the, the main goals of that is uh, growth and tax dilution. Um, and uh, let's see, what else do I have? Based on, basically based on the feedback that I've gotten and the partnerships that I've created and the relationships that I've formed, I feel like I have had a, a positive impact so far on the community. And I guess I just wanna continue that, uh, that process and that progress for the community because I believe in it and um, I think the best days of, for Wasika are not too far off. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Matson. you have three minutes. I'm Milton Matson. I'm 37. I was born and raised here in Wasika. I graduated in 05. I have two kids that are here in the junior high, high school. Um, I enjoy the community. I'm running for mayor to help the city grow to its full potential and hopefully bring more businesses and people to the community. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to our first question. And this question begins with Mr. Zimmerman. And a reminder, you have a minute and a half to respond and then an opportunity for a rebuttal if you choose to when it comes back to you. This first question is related to streets and construction projects. So with the city investing in street construction projects and in aging infrastructure, how do you plan to prioritize capital improvements that will happen in the future while also balancing the challenges that come with a city's fiscal responsibilities? So balancing construction projects that are needed with the challenge of a city budget being managed as well. We'll begin with Mr. Zimmerman. Sure. Um, <clears throat> good question. I think in order to reduce um, tax increases, which the city is now currently looking at a 5.2% um, increase in the levy, um, in the tax rate for the levy, um, and have a steady and consistent financial plan, we must be able to... Um, differentiate costs versus investments and maximize our return on all of our expenditures. Um, the city also needs to be, will, be a willing participant and partner to grow um, with developers and investors. Uh, it, the city needs to be able to create a spark to make something happen. Um, an ideal situation, uh, the city would just set a, uh, have a set comprehensive plan with design standards and, and so on and so forth. But in the situation that we're in and the lack of growth that we've had for the last several years, uh, we, we definitely need to help facilitate um, those investments. So thank you. Mr. Madsen. The balancing priorities. Balancing street construction projects and our infrastructure with the challenge of also managing the city's budget. Well, we'd have to go with the more prioritize where we need it more, and then trying to bring in businesses would help offset the taxes and the people would wanna come here instead of the surrounding areas, which would help offset the tax increases in order to get the more roads and the infrastructure that we need. And I would try and create uh, our help with partnerships and try and find people to bring and just listen to what the community says because it's really more about what they want and bringing them and trying to find a balance of where their priorities along with everybody else's and finding a happy medium there. Mr. Zerman, a rebuttal? Uh, the only thing that I would add is that um, we can't keep the, the proof is in the pudding is is the ConAgra project. That project, provide, even with all the tax abatements, 
and everything that was offered to them to keep them in town um, with the tax abatement in place that will go off in, I think it's 10 years or so, it already added $300,000 to a $5.2 million levy. So that's proof in itself that growth in our industrial and commercial base will help dilute our tax base and take the burden off of city, um, city residents and individual property owners. So um, we, again, we just have to look at the difference between a cost and an investment and, and, and it's, it's a, that's a cultural change but it, and it's, it's happening, but it needs to continue to happen. Mr. Madsen. I'm good. Okay, very good. So our second question is the important issue of addressing housing in Wasika. So the question goes to you first, Mr. Madsen. How will you balance the need for housing while maintaining the city's tax base and infrastructure investment needs? Um, so balancing the, can you repeat that? Balancing the need for housing right. while also maintaining the city's tax base and infrastructure investment. Well, we have uh, plenty of properties around that would help with housing, but it does not seem to be building anything on there. And the more, if we brought more in, the people around here are looking to the other cities because that's where most of the businesses are. So they're not coming here to bring in the building, the, the housing, and that kind of thing. And like numbers wise, I can't really comment on that or anything because I don't know exactly where the budgets and everything are at. Okay. Mr. Zimmerman. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure will. Balancing the need for housing while maintaining the city's tax base and infrastructure investments. Okay, so basically, um, the, the city had a housing study done. And uh, if I remember correctly, the study uh, realized that we need about 300 new rooftops, one way or the other, whether that's through uh, apartment buildings, um, single family houses, townhouses, whatever, 300 new rooftops. That's what we need according to this housing study. Um, that in itself will also help, again, spread out the tax base and dilute the tax base, if that makes sense. And uh, furthermore, um, as far as the funding of that and balancing that, um, it does create a burden on our existing tax base. So what I have done, and I did from the get-go back um, two Januarys ago, was I started the lobbying process at the state level, which, um, according to my sources hasn't happened in 40 years, and uh, that's what I can plan on doing. And we did get uh, almost $3 million from the federal government already to help with those infrastructure costs. So my, my intention is to bring as much tax money back that we pay in to our community. Mr. Madsen, an opportunity for a rebuttal if you care to? I don't have any rebuttal. Okay. Mr. Zimmerman? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. The two are easy to work with. Our next question relates to not a shocking bit of news that Wasika has a tendency to be wet at times. And this last June experienced, much like many communities, very tough decisions on how to deal with how we manage our water. And unfortunately, like many communities, the decision had to be made to discharge sewage into Clear Lake. That doesn't happen frequently, but it also isn't super rare when we're in wet seasons. So the question is, as mayor, what specific strategies, and we begin with you, Mr. Zimmerman, I apologize. As mayor, what specific strategies and plans will you implement to mitigate the city's issues with flooding and improve our sewer management systems? Uh, yes, definitely a huge issue. Um, and the city and our staff and our res again our resources that we um, consult with our engineering consulting firms 
uh, are looking at a lot of that. Um, at the rate that this, again, it goes back to trying to get more funds back into the community that we have paid out to this, whether it's to the state level or the federal level. Um, we need those funds back here desperately to help pay for those. We're, we're looking at issues that are, and problems that are 15, 20, 50, 100 years old. So it's gonna take a little bit of time to do. Um, and, but at the, at the rate that we're going without going out and seeking other resources from the state and the federal governments, it, by the time we might get something fixed, it's gonna have to go back and, and start, all over, start the process all over again. So with some of the projects that we are looking at currently, we have a great opportunity to potentially make some huge headway into alleviating those issues. And I can get into specifics if you want, but I'll wait because my time's up. Okay, Mr. Madsen? I mean, I always look into it. I mean, it's been going on for years. It's trying to get the funding. You'd have to look for grants and stuff. I mean, I don't personally know all the logistics of what all that includes and the types of grants and all that that you need to do it. But I'm, we always look into trying to help out because the community obviously doesn't like when they can't use Clear Lake or Loon Lake for those times. And then it kind of deters people from coming in to the community because they hear of the sewage and stuff going into the lake. So it's always something to look at and try and figure out. I don't, I would have to see everything to know where that all stands. Mr. Zerman. I think it also comes, uh, I neglected to mention the idea of creating partnerships. Again, creating partnerships with our county, um, our county commissioners are in the county staff, and um, along, again, along with our state legislators, which uh, I have already done. And um, uh, it's a matter of being resourceful and being strategic and taking the you seizing on the opportunities that are presented to you to make these uh, really honestly there's potentially a historic f fix for some of these water issues and um, unfortunately they've been deemed controversial but they're not really controversial but they're other rather they're quite opportunistic and and could be greatly beneficial for the entire community if we just allow our staff and allow our consultants to do their work. Okay, Mr. Madsen? I'm good. Okay. Our next question will be submitted from one of the members of our panel, a student of mine from my CIS political science class. What qualities of life experiences do you feel most qualify you for the, for the position of mayor? That is Braden Hoof. He is one of my students. And Mr. Madsen, you get to answer that first. What well, qualities and life experiences do you feel most qualify you for the position of mayor? Um, throughout my life, I've had to deal with a lot of diversity and listening and accepting help. I've had many back surgeries and stuff, and I had a navigate around that and find better ways to move and ask people for help and be a leader in that kind of situation to keep moving forward. I've had to learn how to walk three times and I think I'm doing pretty well and just keep trying to move forward and bring things forward along and people with me and not asking for help is all right and not just trying to do everything for ourselves and get that done. Mr. Zerman. Well, thank you for the question, Brayden. Um, with my educational experience and my work experience and my service to the community, um, again, I, my degree is in construction management, which is a leadership position. I have a minor in business administration, which is, is dives into leadership. Uh, very close to having a degree in urban regional studies, and I studied um, uh, um, community leadership. Um, my work with the 
um, with the coaching and instructing for as many years. Um, I've provided leadership for, for those programs. Uh, again, with my, my church, um, I've provided leadership there. Uh, I was board chair for eight of the 10 years that I was on the school board, so I've provided leadership there. Um, and now I've been mayor for a year and a half, providing leadership with the, with our city and in other capacities. So um, I feel like I'm pretty well versed in the role of leadership. Uh, the key to leadership is being selfless and um, doing it for the right reasons and for the greater good. And um, I think anyone that knows me can attest to that. Mr. Madsen? Um, nothing really, I guess. Okay. And Mr. Zerman. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so this next question has, is a little unique, and it's um, not going to involve a rebuttal. And it actually, the committee wanted to tailor the question in such a way because of the unique situation that each of you is in individually. And so we'll begin with Mr. Zimmerman, and the committee would like you to respond to this, and there will not be a rebuttal period to this. And you will get this question, and you will get a question, Mr. Madsen, that specifically relates to your circumstance. The committee would like you to respond, Mr. Zimmerman, if you are convicted of felony perjury or a lesser crime, should you remain in office? Why or why not? Uh, I would say absolutely, because according um, according to my attorney and other people that I've spoken with, it doesn't actually disqualify you from holding office. So that decision would um, be left up to the voters. And again, uh, for those that elected me the first time and those that elected me under the school board three times, um, they know where I'm at. They know where my heart is. Um, they know what my intentions are. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm following through my, with my intentions. I have a brand new $300,000 house sitting in town. So that's what I got to say about that. Although, otherwise, I can't talk about it. Mr. Madsen, your question specific to your somewhat unique situation is that current counselor Jeremy Conrath is your cousin and Ward 2 candidate Gary Conrath is your uncle. Can you speak to how in the event, if you were elected, that all three of you on the council could keep yourselves from violating the open meeting and serial meeting laws that exist for members of a council when they're not together in a formal meeting? We just, I guess, not going through with the meetings. Or when we get together, we kind of, family-wise, we don't try and be family, not talk about work or politics or any of that, because a lot of the family don't agree with some of the other stuff, so it keeps it a little more peaceful if we just kind of keep everything separate from work and uh, politics and all that from just getting together and being a normal family. Okay, thank you for cooperating with that somewhat unique situation, um, but yet valuable, so thanks for that. Um, the next question will come from a member of our panel. Hello, my name is Dr. Jay Bolfer. I'm on the Wasika Legislative Community, so thank you for putting this all together. Um, uh, both of you, thank you for coming and taking our questions, and thank you to the audience for coming and showing up and supporting. Um, don't worry, there's, you can rest easy. There's no healthcare questions here. We, <laughs> uh, my, first, or my question is, what strategies do you propose to foster economic growth that benefits residents specifically when it comes to job creation and supporting local businesses? Local business, sorry. Thank you, Jay. That question begins with Mr. Madsen. So try and talk to businesses around the area or ones that are looking for building new and try and talk them in and see what we can work with to bring the business here and cooperate with them and <clears throat> might have to do some things that would help. And uh, once we, if you have more businesses around there, 
community and people around the community will want to stay here more so they won't have to go outside and go to Otan or Mankato in order to look for jobs and it'll keep help the small businesses around because it'll also bring the families of the other employees and stuff that aren't from around here for the businesses it'll help bring them into the community thank you mr zerman uh growth um yeah that's pretty much where i've been from the get-go on this whole whole thing um and how do we achieve it uh i created my business by cold calling um and I've been successful at that for 24 plus years. And um, I think along with that is working with our city staff, giving them direction. That's our role as a, as a council and mayor is to give staff um, direction. And, um, and again, creating partnerships. And uh, we need to market Wasika. Um, but first and foremost, we need to have the infrastructure available and ready. Um, just within the last year to 18 months, we have missed out on countless opportunities. One employer was, uh, I believe, was going to provide um, over 300 jobs. And we missed out on that because our infrastructure isn't properly um, prepared for it. And had we done the work that we needed to do four, six, eight, ten years ago, we'd have be having a different story or a different different discussion. So Mr. Madsen, anything to add to yours? No. Mrs. Zerman, another minute and a half. Sure, I'm gonna days. take it. Yeah. Um I think the best growth that we can have is 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 uh I'm always fascinated to to look back at the history of Waseka and the best and most successful businesses that became international companies were all homegrown. Whether it's Herders, Browns, E.F. Johnson, Winnegars, um, Corcoran's, et cetera. I would love nothing more to, than to be able to provide opportunities for gentlemen like Mr. Bolfer here with the question to uh, and, and more of those graduates that went off to, to college or even stayed here and just worked either way, but to come back and, and give them a reason to come back. And in speaking to Mr. Balfour, there's a lot of other professional positions in our community that we have a, that are aging out and um, will be retiring soon. And, and my question is, who's going to replace them? And I think there's uh, an opportunity for us to um, have more of that, but we need to provide those opportunities, and that's the best, best growth that we can have, in my opinion. So, thank you. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. That ends the portion of our prepared questions. The audience will now, during this next 10 minute break, for you to catch your breath, um, the audience can submit um, a question, and those will be collected and sorted through, and we'll ask. Uh, some of those questions in the next few minutes. So go ahead and take a break and catch your breath for about 10 minutes. So what's gonna happen, ladies and gentlemen, is Anna in the back will be picking up any questions you may have. She will deliver them to the panel. The panel will discuss those questions, put them together, and our moderator will ask them. So Anna. All right, welcome back. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin. Um, Thank you, gentlemen, again, for your participation. And thanks to those in the audience who um, submitted questions. I have in my hand uh, five uh, that the panel has submitted that they would like you to address. And um, we'll begin this next question. Mr. Zerman, it's your turn to begin first. And I'm going to do my best to kind of summarize this. Um, in past years, discussions have been brought about having a joint or combined law enforcement between Waseca County Sheriff's Office and the Waseca PD. The question is, the two would be combined in, in terms of law enforcement in the city and area. Do you have an opinion on this? And how do you feel about it? Um, do you see that as something worth pursuing or looking into? In, in general, what are your thoughts on a combined law enforcement between Waseca County Sheriff 
and watch the Wikipedia. Sure. Um, I guess I would preface it with by saying that I'm I'm always willing to entertain efficiencies um, and partnerships and collaboration. Uh, with that said, um, law enforcement. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not well versed in law enforcement for the most part, as far as um, their ratios and their hierarchy in in leadership. So, um, but if if the if the sheriff's department and the Wasika police department came and presented a plan to uh, facilitate something like that, I would entertain it absolutely. But um, it has to work for them. I think the bottom line is public safety and and what's best for the community. And uh, as far as I know, just again within the last. 18 months we have um, hired on I think three or four new officers um, so I, I'm definitely interested in a robust public safety uh, apparatus Mr. Madsen I guess just kind of partial to it because I don't know the logistics of it and would be open to seeing what if it's obviously more efficient or would help either or the departments out or what would make what better and obviously again like the public safety was the number one and so if it creates a safer community around not just with Sika, but the county and stuff would also help other because without like seeing uh you know, how it helps or the business type plan of it there's i can't really for sure comment of which way i would lean on that a rebuttal? Um, no, other than, um, yeah, uh, the, the two departments would have to determine what's best for them and, and, and know that it would be a long-term commitment. It wouldn't be something like for four years or even eight years. It would have to be a, a fundamental change in, in our local and countywide law enforcement. So that's a big endeavor but yeah I would, I would entertain it um as far as i'm concerned the wasika community is much larger than the city limits um so i'll just yeah leave it at that mr Matson. pretty much just the same i guess okay um next question submitted from our audience um deals with absentee landlords and we'll begin with you mr Matson. Um, how do you propose to deal with absentee landlords who leave buildings vacant and related to that in general, dealing with vacant storefront, vacant buildings? Do you have ideas or thoughts on how a city ought to approach that issue? Just maybe try and work with them and see if there's any other businesses or people around that might want to combine the uh, open spaces into something or move forward and be open to ideas of and try and help them uh, find someone that would help come in or just even make it look more presentable to have people come in and want to use them spaces and if bringing them in and opening that up would also help bring in people from around the communities, other communities, and want to make them more operatable than that. Mr. Zerman. Uh, well, I'm an architect, and, uh, an architect by trade and profession, so I'm a visual guy. Um, uh, I would uh, and, and I'd lead us towards having um, some consistent uh, design standards and that are enforced consistently, um, whether it's through uh, code enforcement or, uh, and we do have code enforcement and we have a new code enforcement officer. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, we want to hold people accountable, right? So um, I think based off of our city code and, and our design standards, I think it's only fair um, because the blight unfortunately does affect others. So, yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's 
okay and good to to um, uphold consistently uphold those uh, those codes that are in place. Anything to add to your previous answer? Mm, no. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Our next question submitted. And we've alluded to it a little bit earlier, but let's specifically focus on how to deal best with Clear and Loon Lake. And we'll begin this question with Mr. Zimmerman. The question is, are there any plans or what might be your plans to deal with the pollution in Clear and Loon Lake? Well, again, it goes back to infrastructure and the funding for that infrastructure and the um, thinking a little bit outside of the box and seizing the, the opportunities for um, those remedies. And it's not, there's no one answer, no silver bullet, but um, to get into a specific, uh, there's an opportunity with the Gator Lake project to open up and, and um, on an adjacent property for a quite large retention pond that we could divert stormwater to, um, to, I, I believe it's the 15, one dish or 15, two ditch. And, um, that would help, um, alleviate a lot of the water issues, not only for the South half of the community or the South half of the city, but potentially the North half as well. And, um, that's a bit of an undertaking and, um, but it would be a significant and, and huge, um, solution for us for Clear Lake and, you know, the, the, the whole watershed runs west to east. So yes, absolutely. Mr. Madsen. So just the pollution of the, the, the question asks, are there any plans or what might be your plans to deal with the pollution in Clear and Loon Lake? Yeah, it's just, there's not one way to just solve everything, but just look at the infrastructure and try and find new ways or other advance or help the current system be better other than the way it's going without seeing the whole plans or if there's anything in are set forth now it's kind of hard to comment on if there's a plan going forward but obviously I would like to not have the pollution in the lakes and try and solve in any means possible with still not raising taxes or making any burdens on any other people Mr. Zerman anything to add to your previous answer uh, no, other than the fact that um, I have to commend the, the, the county for the work that they've done um, in purchasing the weed harvester, and the city has partnered with them a little bit on that as well. Um, that has been making a dent in, in, in the, the Clear Lake so far, so good. Um, but uh, yes, so to really answer the questions, there are s solutions being discussed and plans being discussed. And I would like to think that I have been um, helping to push that along. That's what leaders do. Mr. Madsen? Nothing. Okay. Next question, and we'll begin with you on this one. Um, the city of Wasika has um, most recently devoted quite a bit of time and energy and discussion to uh, the Gator Lake circumstance and the project related to Gator Lake. Um, this particular person would like to know where you stand and where you see the best possible solution related to the Gator Lake issue. Yeah, can't 100% say without knowing the logistics and comp complete part of it, but with developing it, we, from what I understand, the city would be paying for developing it and making new lots and that but with nothing coming in, there's nothing for certain to make sure that it sells or that anything it would help or benefit. And this time, I'm not saying that later on, it might not be a bad thing to develop and have the lots and that available, but without bringing anything or having anything here to want people to move in with an empty lot, there's, no real reason and from what I understand there's 
rent or the farmers renting the land. So if you develop that, and that would take away the income from that without any for certain income coming in. Mr. Zerman. Uh, I am absolutely in favor of developing not only the Gator Lake property as it's been dubbed, but um, any and everywhere else around town that we can um, make something happen. In particular, the Gator Lake project, um, as it sits, that property is valued at $600,000. If it's fully developed, when it's fully developed, it'll be a, a, at a value of $24 million. Imagine what that does to our tax base. That's significant. And the investment from the investment, not the cost, but the investment from the city would be approximately one, or I think it's around $1 million. We would generate that, we, that would be paid for in less than 10 years per our financial consultant that took a look at it. And anything after that is, goes into our, um, our general levy for the foreseeable future. So you can say you want growth, but then, but do you, if you actually, uh, you have to support growth if you, if, you, if you want growth. And as it sits right now, um, because of the precarious situation that the community or the city is in, developers, whether it's Wasika or Mankato or Otan or anywhere else, will not partner or will not develop without partnership from the, from the city um, and local government. That's just a fact. Mr. Matson, anything you'd like to add? I mean, obviously, I like growth, and there's other places around Wasika that are already developed and stuff for them to come in. But as of right now, I can't say definitively either side of what, but as of right now, I don't see where this lot sitting benefits and will take taxes away from the other community members. Mr. Zierman, anything you'd like to add? Uh, it's it's simple math as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's it's, and nobody gets a return on their investment before they make the investment. Like, that. I've never heard of anyone being like, "Hey, I just made ten thousand dollars on an investment that I'm going to make tomorrow." It doesn't happen. You have to make the investment, and it's always a risk. There's always a risk involved, but if it's um, well thought out and well researched, hopefully you'll get that return. Okay, one more question, our last question. Um, this question relates to speed limits in and around the edge of Wasika, and it's referencing specifically the speed limit just beyond just north of the stoplight, and I'm pointing out at Walmart right now, uh, just beyond Walmart. And the question references the question about the idea of changing the speed limits in and around Wasika. But let's kind of package that this way. How best do you think you as a mayor should facilitate those kind of decision making? How should that go about? And what would you do as a mayor, say in this example, to deal with the best way to go about making a decision as the mayor to change something like that, whether it's traffic related, speed limit related, or whatever it might be, and you can use a specific example of speed limit, or you could use any decision. How, as the mayor, should you lead in such a way to make that decision process healthy? Sorry, that was very wordy, but I just wanted to make that fit in that package of the person's request. So we will begin that with Mr. Zimmerman. Okay, well, I appreciate that question because we actually discussed this last, uh, just within the last year. Um, by request, and we did get a report from MnDOT because, um, fortunately, unfortunately, MnDOT has juris jurisdiction with, with that because it, it is a state highway, and their findings um, are that it's a non-issue. Um, I personally disagree with that um, because... Uh, but you know, I, I, again, it's being there's a difference between being proactive and reactive, and um, I don't think that we need to wait for another c c uh, catastrophe to happen uh, and, uh, if if it's if we don't have to. So um, 
we haven't talked about it. I can't remember when that was that we talked about it, but uh, it's been a few months. But as far as I'm concerned, if we if the city has the ability to put and adjust the, the speed limit there, um, I would be in favor of doing it, th that site specifically. There's, there's certain rules and laws that supersede state laws, and that might be one of them. I believe it is, actually. Okay. Mr. Madsen? So, yeah, I would be in favor of changing it because it goes from 55 right by that stoplight. I mean, kind of hard to slow down, especially when you're coming out of over a hill and you're not, especially if you're not from around here, you don't know that it changes right there. So I'd be in favor of that, but obviously we'd have to work with MnDOT and that if it's their jurisdiction and that it can't just change it for, yeah, I have to go through the, but I'd be in favor of making that a lot safer area to be. Mr. Z Mr. Zerman, excuse me, anything you'd like to add to that? Nope. Okay. Mr. Matson, back to you. Anything you'd like to add? Nope. Okay. Very good. So we're going to finish, <clears throat> excuse me, with a closing statement. And based on the whole coin flip that happened earlier, we're going to have a minute and a half for a closing statement. And I'll remind you that the closing statement is focused on you. And we want it to be your sales pitch about you, not your opponent, but about you. So we'd like for a minute and a half to convince the voters um, why you are uh, worthy of this office. So uh, we'll begin with you, Mr. Matson. Um, I'm running for the office to be a, a spokesperson for the community and help grow the community and listen to everybody and not just what I want or what this person wants, try to be bring a happy medium to the town and help it grow and be the good city that it could be and just giving you an option a younger try and be one of the younger ones to be that middle ground of the older generation and the younger generation try and bring everybody together thank you mr sermon um again thank you for facilitating thank you to the chamber as well thank you mikhail and thank you to the Jeepers, the panel <laughs> and the audience. Um, much like the election two years ago, and I think the reason I got elected was that th this comes down to growth. Growth for the community and, and being serious about that growth and being serious about alleviating the tax, the, the, the high tax rate. Uh, right now our tax rate is 78%, but um, three or four years ago, the tax rate was 92%. And the reason that that has come down is a lot to do with ConAgra and through some attrition and efficiencies that the city staff has found. Um, so, but with that, um, it comes down to growth and I want to continue the work that, that we've done. I've created some, again, some good relationships and partnerships with um, several stakeholders. And uh, let's see what else do I have. Um, yeah, I, I just those that know me know where I'm at and what my intentions are, and and um, I'm serious about getting the work done. If we don't want growth, I'm not your guy. So, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we appreciate your participation tonight. Um, this is a very valuable project, a very valuable process, and we are so grateful that you were here tonight. Also thankful for many people that contributed behind the scenes to make this work. I want to make you aware that the debates can be viewed um, via the Chamber's website and Chamber YouTube page, as well as Wasika School District's webpage. Uh, those should be up relatively soon, within the next 24 to 48 hours. Again, thanks to our candidates. Thank you to our audience. And uh, thanks for your support of the Wasika Votes Debate Program.